As we draw near to God and worship this morning, we take as our call to worship the opening words of Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We live in in a time of fear. We live in a world of fear in which people are are filled with with fear and anxiety and, and great worry. And here in this psalm, we have the answer to our fears and to our worries, the, the great assurance and comfort that the child of God has whenever we're faced with, with fear. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Amen. We come to God and and worship our opening praise this morning is from Psalm 34. Psalm 34, it's on page 63 of our psalm books. And we're singing the opening four verses of this psalm. If you don't have a psalm book in front of you, you maybe have the the words on your your computer screen or telephone screen in in front of you. Psalm 34, and we're singing verses 1 to 4. A reminder that that we are people of fear and a reminder of the one whom we should go to in our our fears. The psalmist says in, in verse 2, In all my fears I sought the Lord, from him deliverance came. He experienced in verse 4 God himself encompassing him, surrounding him. The angel of the Lord encamps round those who do him fear, he says, encamps around them so that they by him delivered are. What a wonderful comfort for the child of God to know that through faith in in God, that, that God is his God and God is with him. And God in the presence of the Holy Spirit surrounds and camps himself, surround his people in their times of fear. Psalm 34, we will sing the first four verses of this psalm. Let's praise God. bow our heads and close our eyes and come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as weak and and worried people, fearful and and anxious. We confess, Lord, that it, it is in our very nature to be worried and fearful, and there's so much going on in, in the world around us these days, in our own lives, that, that stirs up fear and worry in our hearts and in our minds. 
We come this morning, Lord God, and we lay all our worries and anxieties before your great throne. Worries about the coronavirus, worries about the effect that it is having on on our country and our communities, the potential effect on, on ourselves, our families, our loved ones, our ability to provide for our loved ones. We lay all these fears and anxieties before you, Heavenly Father. We thank you that, that you're a, a God who has provided us with such comfort in the the, the midst of, of fears. That you're a God who commands your people not to fear and tells us why it is possible that we for us not to fear. We thank you, Lord, that we there is no need to fear for for your children because we have you as a, a great God with us in the midst of, of all the situations of life. You're, you go before us, you stand behind us, you stand beside us in all our fears and anxieties. You have promised to be with us. You have promised to be our God. You have promised to, to strengthen us. You have promised to help us. You have promised to, to uphold us. We thank you for this this little psalm that we have been singing that, that, that tells us that in our fears when we cry to you and we come to you as, as our God and our Father, that you come to your people and, and you surround us with your almighty arms and you protect us in the midst of our fears. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the one who makes this possible, for, for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, who came into this world and died on the cross, took our sins upon himself as he died on the cross, took our punishment that we deserve so that that we might be reunited with you and and made sons of God, servants of God, so that we might know you as our Father once more and we might rest underneath the protection of your almighty arms. And so, Lord, as we come before you, we we pray for a sense of of this protection. We pray for an awareness of this protection as we go out and we we face the world in this coming week. We pray for for your children who, who are facing this illness, Lord, that they would know your protection. We pray for those who have been bereaved, who have lost family members and loved ones, friends, that that they, as they cry out to you, would know the protection of of this psalm, the care of your loving arms around about them. We pray, Lord, for our our healthcare professionals, our doctors, our our nurses, those in in hospice services and and nursing homes, pharmacists, ambulance drivers and paramedics. Lord, that that as they look to you and cry out to you in, in their fears, that that you would come to them, you would draw them to yourself and, and they would know the protection that, that is spoken of in, in this psalm. Lord, as we come before you in worship now, we ask that you would calm our hearts, still our minds, take away all those things that would seek to distract us from, from your word, help us to, to focus on you in this next short while and we pray that, that you would open our eyes to the wonders of your word, to the promises in your word, to the fearlessness that is proclaimed and, and promised in your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. If you have a copy of God's word in front of you, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. As we continue our study of the God of all comfort, as he reveals himself in Isaiah, we come this morning to Isaiah chapter 41 and we're going to read the first 14 verses of this chapter. Isaiah 41 Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east, whose victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him, so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely, by paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbour and says to his brother, Be strong. Craftsman strengthens the goldsmith 
and he who smooths with the hammer him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, It is good. And they strengthen it with nails, so that it cannot be moved. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Please keep that passage of God's Word open in front of you as we come to to look at what God is saying to us today through it. Fear. Anxiety. They're some of our most common feelings, aren't they? Seldom a day goes by when we don't experience fear in one of its many guises. From something as as simple as worrying about the weather to to those more stomach-churning fears about your health or your finances, your family, your, your future. We are fearful people. People of, of fear. And knowing our tendency to fear, one of the most repeated commands that God gives his children in the Bible is do not fear. Do not be anxious. A command that that's accompanied with a whole mountain of reasons why we're not to be afraid and not to be anxious. And in our study of the God of all comfort, as he reveals himself in this little book of Isaiah, we come today to one of those passages in which God commands his people not to fear. In Isaiah 41, verses 8 to 14, on three separate occasions, God repeats the command, Fear not. And he shows us how and why we can be people who fear not. The need for for this command uh, to God's people in in these verses to not be afraid, it's it's abundantly clear from verses 1 to 7. God tells them they're going to be invaded by, by a ruthless invader once again. They're going to face again all the terrifying consequences that come with, with invasion. After being pummeled into submission by Babylon, after witnessing the devastation of their country, the death of, of so many of their countrymen, after being carried away into exile in Babylon, they're going to experience the trauma of invasion a second time. In verses 1-7, to God tells him he's going to raise up another king. He'll come from the east with his army and he's going to sweep everything in front of him. He'll trample kings and nations under his foot, crushing them into the very dust. From our vantage point in in history, we know that the king he's speaking about is is Cyrus, the, the king of Persia, who conquered Babylon about 539 B.C., And God knows that the prospect of another brutal invasion is going to stir up these feelings of fear, deep-seated fear within his people. It's the response of the the godless nations around Israel. In verse 5, God says, The coastlands, the the godless nations surrounding Israel, those who don't know and, and trust God, They're going to respond to the the conquest and slaughter of Cyrus in complete terror. He says they will see and be afraid. The ends of the earth will tremble. And in verses 6 to 7, God describes how those godless nations are going to try and overcome their fear. 
it's a twofold approach that 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 really is it's pitiful in verse 6 he says everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother be strong be strong they try and encourage each other with words like be strong they have nothing to, to offer each other except these empty words words without any real hope or comfort or assurance And in verse 7 he says, they turn to their idols, false gods who are powerless to help them in the coming crisis. Idols that idols that need kneeled down because they can't even stand up on their own. Completely powerless to help against Cyrus and his army. As I said, it's pitiful really. Pitiful. And sadly, These are the very same ways the godless deal with their fears today. In the 3,000 years since this book has been written, really nothing has changed. We've witnessed in in recent weeks a, a tidal wave of death and devastation that has swept across the world from the east. And how has the world responded? Those who don't trust God, how have they responded? With empty words. Be strong. We're going to beat this. We're going to get through this. Keep going because together we will beat this virus is is the repeated mantra of one of the, the advertisements on television. And all of them are empty words with no real substance or assurance. Empty, groundless, vain promises. Little more than wishful thinking. And the world has turned to its idols. They're false gods. Science, science is going to get us through. Medicine is going to get us through. Self will get us through. Our own strength, our own wisdom, our own intelligence. Money. The world has turned to its false gods, none of which can even stand on their own, all of which are powerless without God. God is speaking to the world today in this current crisis in exactly the same way that he is speaking in this chapter. He's showing mankind today our frailty and the certainty of his coming judgment. He's graciously calling mankind to put his faith in him. And how is the world responding? By continuing to reject him. By continuing to run to their useless idols, trying to comfort themselves with empty platitudes. And in verse 8, God turns to his people and he says, You're to be different from the world. You're not to be fearful. You're not to be terrified in the face of Cyrus. Fear not, he says. And God's commands of, of, of comfort, these words of comfort that he gives his people in this passage, they're not empty words like the, the world's words of comfort. He tells his people how they can remain unafraid when the world is quivering in its boots. How they can face Cyrus without fear. How we can face our current crisis and all its consequences without fear. How we can face any and every worrying situation without fear. How? By keeping a proper perspective. By remembering our privileged position. And by remembering God's precious promises. Those are our three little headings under which we're going to study these verses this morning. Firstly, God's people are to face terrifying situations without fear by keeping a proper perspective. God's people can face terrifying situations without fear as they keep a proper perspective. God asks in in verses 21 to 23, which of the gods worshipped by the nations was he able to tell what was going to happen in the future? And the answer comes back in, in verse 28. None of them. None of them. None of those gods are able to predict the future. They are nothing. They are useless. They're a lie. Whereas God's people, whenever they saw Cyrus rise in the east, whenever they heard his army was sweeping across the continent towards them, they would know in their minds, well, God has told us this would happen. Things are happening exactly as I told us they would. They'd know in the words of verse 20 that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. 
and having told them what was going to happen hundreds of years beforehand, his people would know without a shadow of a doubt that he was Almighty God, who alone knew what was going to happen in the future, because he determined what happened in the future, and brought to pass whatever he determined in his sovereign control. They would know without a shadow of doubt, God has raised up Cyrus. God has given the nations over to him. What's happening today is the outworking of his plan and and, and purpose. Plans that are perfect, plans that are good and right, because he is perfect, good and right. And they would rest in that proper perspective. And friends, that is the perspective that God wants his people to have in fearful situations. A perspective that enables us not to fear. The perspective that remembers God is in complete control. Everything that's happening is the outworking of his plans and purposes, both for mankind and for me. Purposes that, although I can't understand because my understanding falls far short of his perfect understanding, Nonetheless, I know that they are perfect, they are good and right, because he is perfect, good and right. Cyrus and his army, terrifying as they were, they were part of God's plan for the world. Coronavirus and all its terrifying consequences, or anything else causing you fear today, it's all part of God's plan. He's behind them all. He is over them. He is controlling them in the outworking of his sovereign, perfect plan and purposes, both for mankind and for you. And that's the proper perspective you're to remember, child of God, in situations of fear. The proper perspective that will enable you to face those situations without fear. The first way that we face terrifying situations without fear is by keeping this proper perspective. But secondly, God's people can face terrifying situations without fear by remembering our privileged position. We can face terrifying situations without fear by remembering our privileged position. Look down at verses 8 to 9. God turns from the the godless nations who he's been addressing up until this point, and now he speaks to Israel. He says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. He says to them, you aren't like these other nations. In fact, you're unlike any other nation on earth. You are a nation I've I've brought to myself to reveal myself to, to know me, to know my commands and, and my will, to serve me. And as my servant to come under my protection. They're in the privileged, the wonderfully, gloriously privileged position of being servants of God. They failed in their calling as servants. They haven't been the servants that God wants them to be. That's why they're in Babylon whenever Cyrus appears with his army. But nonetheless, despite the fact that they haven't been the servants that God wants them to be, it it doesn't change the fact of their privileged position as God's servants. And he reminds them here how they've reached this privileged position. He says, You, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, He says, you've reached this position of servant of God with all its privileges because I chose you for it from all the nations in the world. I selected you above all others to enjoy this unique, special, privileged position. And he reminds them how he chose them. He says, you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, My friend. The word translated my friend means my loved one. God chose Abraham and his descendants to be his special privileged people in his love. 
He didn't choose them because they were better or more worthy than all the other nations, because quite simply they weren't. He chose them simply on the basis of his love. He chose them in love to be the recipients of his love. And in verse 9, he describes how he made them his own in love. He says, I took you from the ends of the earth. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. When God says here, I took you from the ends of the earth, the word that is translated took, it means to seize. It means to, to grab, to grip firmly. He's saying, I took you firmly in my grasp. I grabbed you and made you my own and I will never, ever, ever let you go. He's saying to his people in, in Babylon in these verses, that's your privileged position. You're servants of God. You're chosen by me and my love. You've been plucked from obscurity into this wonderful position with a grip that will never let you go. And as this crisis unfolds and escalates, as Cyrus marches towards you, leaving a trail of devastation and death in his trail, he says, remember your privileged position. Remember who you are. Remember what you are to me. Remember what you mean to me. Special, chosen, loved, held by me. And friends, that's the position of every child of God. That your position today, your position now, if you're one of his children through faith in Jesus. You're a servant of God. A member of his household, someone that he's brought to himself to reveal himself to, someone whom he's given the great privilege of serving him, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And who, despite your feelings, your constant feelings as his servant, he retains you in his service. It's a position you enjoy because he chose you to it, he chose you in his love. To be the recipient of his love. Love that's gracious. Love that he shows to the unlovable. Love that is extraordinary in its extent. Love that is costly. Love that's sacrificial. A love that sent his son into the world as the perfect servant. The perfectly obedient servant of God. Being obedient even to the point of death on the cross, we're told in Philippians where he took the punishment for your sins so that you could be forgiven and made a servant of God. Love that took hold of you, love that grabbed you, love that plucked you from obscurity and will never let you go. You're grabbed by God in those powerful hands that we looked at last week in Isaiah chapter 40. God says to you here in these verses, in situations where you're tempted to be afraid, remember your privileged position. Remember who you are. Remember what you are to me, what you mean to me. You are servants of God, members of my household, chosen by me in my love for you in Christ, plucked from obscurity into this privileged position, grabbed by God in his almighty grasp that will never, ever let you go. And as the current crisis unfolds, as it rolls along, leaving its trail of death and devastation in its wake, as further crises come into your life in the coming years, Child of God, remember your privileged position. The second way we face terrifying situations without fear is by remembering our privileged position. A proper perspective, our privileged position. Thirdly, God's people can face terrifying situations without fear by remembering God's precious, precious promises. God's people can face terrifying situations without fear by remembering God's precious promises. In verse 10, God gives us five glorious promises to stop us giving way to fear. And his first promise in, in verse 10 is, I am with you. He says, fear not, for I am with you. 
They won't face Cyrus and his army and the terror that they bring alone. They'll face it with God at their side. And this is the promise that runs right the way through Scripture. It's a promise that God gave Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when he sent him into Egypt to confront mighty Pharaoh. He said, I will be with you. It's a promise he gave Joshua. In Joshua 1 and verse 5 when he, he gave him the daunting task of being Moses' successor. He said, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. It's a promise that Christ gives his people in Matthew 28 before he ascended into glory. I am with you always to the end of the age. The promise he gives his people in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with us always. Whether it's the coronavirus crisis or whatever other crisis that you face before he calls you home to be with him, he is with you in them all. And what a wonderful promise for the child of God today as we isolate to avoid this virus. What a wonderful promise to those of you who, are, who I know who are isolating on your own without another soul in your house, without seeing a single soul from week to week. God says, you're not alone. You may feel alone, but you're not alone. You're never alone and you never will be alone. I am with you, so do not fear. The second promise that we see here in verse 10 is, I am your God. I am your God. He says in verse 10, Be not dismayed, for I am your God. He promises himself to the people of Judah. He commits himself to them to be their God. In chapter 40, in our last study, in Isaiah chapter 40, we saw that the people of, of Judah in exile were wondering whether God saw them, whether he cared for them, or whether he'd forgotten all about them and he'd cast them off completely. And God says to them here, he says, I am still your God. I always will be your God. You will always be my people. I'll never abandon you. I'll never give you up. I'll never cast you off. I've covenanted. I've promised. I've, I've committed myself to, to be your God. And that will never, ever change. And again, this is a promise he makes to every one of his children. Be not dismayed. Do not fear, for I am your God. I've covenanted myself to you to your care, to your keeping, to your protection, to bring you through every fear-inducing circumstance in life to be with me. And nothing can break that covenant. I am your God. I always will be your God. And I will fulfill the promises, the commitments I've made to you as your God. He says to you today in this passage, child of God, I am your God. Never forget that. Never doubt that. No matter what you face, I am your God. So do not fear. I am with you. I am your God. God's third promise is, I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. He says, when you hear Cyrus' army is, is approaching and you begin to feel anxious, when you feel the earth tremble at the approach of his massive army and, and your knees begin to, to knock together in fear, he says, I'll strengthen you. I'll give you the strength you need to face Cyrus and whatever else comes along. And again, friends, this is a promise he gives all his children. He says, when you are weak, I will strengthen you. It's a promise that, that prompted Paul to say in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10, when I am weak, oh, then I am strong. He knew when he experienced weakness and turned to God in his weakness that God would give him strength far beyond his own feeble strength. When he was weak, he was strong. Child of God, don't be afraid of, of feeling weak. Don't be afraid of looking weak. Don't be afraid of acknowledging your weakness and dependence on God. Because when you do, 
When you cry out to God in your weakness, he gives you strength far, far beyond your own feeble strength. When you're weak, then you're strong. So whatever's making you tremble in weakness and fear today, whether it's coronavirus or crite or cancer or some other crisis, he says, I will strengthen you. I'll give you all the strength you need to face it and come through. So do not fear. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. God's fourth promise is, I will help you. I will help you. It's not only strength that we need in our weakness. It's help, support, assistance. And God promises us here in this verse all the help we need. God says to the people of Judah, whatever help you need to face Cyrus, I'll give it. To those of his children whose fears today stem from the pressures in work or increased pressure at home because of this current crisis, he says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Whatever help you need, I'll give it. To those of his children whose fears stem from financial pressures, he says to you today, do not fear. I'll help you. I'll provide for you. Whatever help you need, I'll give it. To those of you whose fears stem from your marriage situation, he says, do not fear. I will help you. Whatever help you need, I will give it. To those of you today whose, whose fears maybe stem from your children and, and decisions that they're making, the attitudes that, that they're displaying, he says, do not fear. I will help you. Whatever help you need, I will give it. All the grace, wisdom, all the discernment, and understanding all the patience and protection, all the faculties you need in the situation you're going through, rest assured, God will provide. He will help you. So do not fear. God's final promise here in these verses is, I will uphold you. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Finally, I will uphold you. He says in verse 10, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He says, in terrifying situations, I will never let you fall. I will hold you. I will support you. I will keep you by my right hand. And just in case you doubt his ability to uphold you by his right hand. Just in case you doubt his ability to grip onto you and never ever let you go. Look back at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12. One of the verses we looked at last week. Remember his hands? How his almighty hands were described in that verse? He has measured the waters, the waters of the earth in the hollow of his hand. Hands that marked off in one span the width of the universe. He marked off the heavens with a span of his hand. Those same hands that hold all the waters of the earth, that measure out the span of heaven, those same hands are the hands that uphold you, that have taken hold of you in their almighty grasp and will never let you go. Friends, there's no doubting his ability to uphold you and keep you in the midst of any and every terrifying circumstance of life. Whatever's got you trembling, whatever's got you weak at the knees today, whether it's coronavirus or some other crisis going on in your life, God says, I will uphold you. So do not fear. Child of God, these are precious promises. They're precious because of what they promise, but they're precious also because of the one who makes them. The I in I am with you. The I in I am your God. The I in I will strengthen you. I will help you. 
I will uphold you. The one who makes these promises is no mere mortal, no mere man, not even a great man. The one who makes these promises is the great I am, the self-existent, eternal, unchangeable, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, faithful God who is able to keep them, who will keep them. So remember these promises, trust these promises, cling to them, claim them in times of crisis so that you, through faith in them, by clinging to them in trust, will be able to face those situations without fear. A proper perspective. God's in control today and every day. A privileged position. Servants of God, chosen by him in his love, gripped eternally in God's almighty grasp. Precious promises. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. That's what enables us to obey God's command in terrifying situations. Not to be afraid. Child of God, do not fear. Don't be afraid. But if you're not a Christian today, this passage says that you should be afraid. In fact, you should be very afraid. The terror that God sends in this life is a gracious, gracious warning to you of the infinitely greater terror that you're going to experience for eternity in hell. The mighty hand that we see here gripping and upholding his people is the hand that will one day crush you again in hell. And your perspective is one of judgment instead of safety because your position is that of an enemy instead of a servant. The promise that God makes you, it isn't protection. It's punishment Eternal, terrible, agonizing, horrendous, heartbreaking punishment. And the events that we're going through today, the words in, in this passage that we have read and studied today, they are the gracious warning of a gracious God who is calling you today, be afraid. Be afraid. Be very afraid. And instead of running in fear to your idols and the empty words of comfort from the world, instead will you not run to God. I urge you this morning to run to God for forgiveness and know the assurance, know the comfort, the consolation, know the fearlessness that God promises in this passage as your own. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. We'll close our eyes and bow our heads and come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the wonderful comfort and consolation and encouragement of this little passage. We thank you for the reminder of this eternal perspective, that you're in complete control of everything that happens in the world and, and in our lives, that we can rest assured that you're working out your plans and purposes, plans and purposes that are good, that are perfect and right, because you are good and perfect and completely right. We thank you for the the reminder of our privileged position. We are servants of God, chosen by you in love and held in, in your almighty hand and going to be held there by your grasp for, for eternity. We thank you that no matter what comes along, nothing can pull you or pull us from your grasp, take us out of your almighty hand. Nothing can change our privileged position as your blood-bought children. We thank you for these glorious, precious promises. 
that in everything that we face, you're with us, that you're our God, that you strengthen us, that you help us, that you uphold us with your righteous right hand. We pray, Heavenly Father, that these promises would encourage us, would would comfort us, would console us in these days of fear, that we would remember them, that we would trust them, that they we would cling to them, that as we fill our hearts and minds with them, they would banish all thought of fear from, from those very hearts and minds. Lord, for those this morning whose hearts are filled with fear, those of your children who are fearful and anxious and worried, we pray that you would take these words, you would embed them in their hearts, you would encourage them, comfort, console them with these words, uh, and, and so banish their fears. We pray, Lord, for those who, who aren't your children, those who don't trust you this morning, who are fearful. We pray, Lord, that they would respond to those fears, not by, by running off to the idols of, of the world, not by running to the empty words of consolation of the world, but by running to you and knowing the, the reality of these wonderful promises in their own life. Lord, we pray that as we go into another week of uncertainty and anxiety, pressure, another week of, of isolation and, and loneliness, so many anxieties and worries, Lord, and plant these words in our hearts, we pray, that we would face this week with you, without any fear. Amen. We're going to close our worship service by singing from Psalm 73. Psalm 73, the A version of the psalm. We're singing verses 12 to 15. It's on page 159 of our psalm books. Or if you don't have a psalm book in front of you, then you will have the words on your computer screen or on your phone screen in front of you. Psalm 73A, verses 12 to to 15. A psalm that reminds us of some of these promises that we we were looking at in Isaiah chapter 41. The reminder of, of God's continual presence with us as our God. I'm continually with you, the psalmist says. Firm hold of my right hand you have. With counsel wise you'll be my guide. And then in glory me receive. There are the, the assurance in, in verse 13 that we have no need of fear, no need to be afraid. The reality that we do feel afraid, but there's no need to be afraid. My flesh and heart may faint, but God's my strength. God's my portion evermore. That promise, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you. Psalm 73a, verses 12 to 15. Let's praise God.
now receive the blessing of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain on God's people, both now and forevermore. Amen.